thread with him doing that. I have to follow it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, we were sitting here yesterday, and I came over. Uh, Adam and I we put the plastic up. Actually, I, I, I got the plastic, and, and I got the knife, and Adam and Greg and I were cutting the plastic, and I was going to help put the plastic up, so what I did, I watched them put the plastic up. I did the, the fruit thing. But they got the plastic put up, so if you're dark in here, if y'all hadn't realized, it also makes it a lot cooler in here. Uh, not cool enough for me, though. I'm sorry. Just got to go. You know, it's good to have somebody like me. I've got an awesome wife. Uh, if you want to, while the kids are going out, we're going to be in Exodus again today. And I, I don't know if I can follow that up or not, but I tried to see if God would lay something on my heart to go along with that. I said, there's no way I can touch it. There's just no way. But the fact of the matter is, he would release me from what he laid on my heart about going through the Ten Commandments. Because the reality is that in our life, in our daily walk, in our life, God gave us command today of the way we're supposed to live today. Not just some days, but every day. And those commandments are alive today, and as we've already talked about the others, uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, as I said. And it's going to be real hard for y'all to remember this. You're going to have to stand up for a long time. So if you found Exodus 20 and verse 13, if you would, let's stand in honor of God, the reason of God's word. Now you're fine not reading the same way as the one I've got. But it's real simple. The scripture says, Thou shalt not murder. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the awesomeness of who you are. And we thank you for, Lord, just add blessing to the reading of your word that we'll understand what it means today with these scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we look at this word, uh, one of the things that we need to understand is God is calling a mandate for the sanctity of human life. And we need to see that today. And He prohibits murder of human beings. Bob, he proclaimed the sanctity. And listen, in a culture that we live in today, it's a culture of death. Uh, a culture that threatens our very world that we live in. Think about it. September 11th, 2001. I bet every one of you can tell me what you were doing. I can tell you what I was doing. I was sitting in my office. I was studying. And uh, one of my friends that was at the church, I was at uh, Mount Warren Baptist Church, and one of my friends that I played golf with on a regular basis, Brantley, called me. And he says, are you watching the news? I said, nothing. I said, why? He says, you need to turn the news on and watch it. A plane has just flown in to one of the Twin Towers in New York. And before I could get there, the other plane had flown into the other tower in New York. And then a few minutes later, they reported that the plane had flown into the Pentagon and a fourth one had crashed in a field in uh, Pennsylvania. And, of course, they grounded all the planes. And 3,000 people, over 3,000 people lost their lives that day. So we live in a culture that deals with death. And then we see that over and over again. Think about what we watch. And then I'm going to tell you, our daily lives. I was just mentioning in Sunday school this morning. You know what? I can't remember a day going by recently where somebody didn't get shot or killed in Savannah. Amen. And if it's that bad in Savannah, think about what it's like in Atlanta. There's only a couple hundred thousand people in Savannah. There's four million in Atlanta. In the metro Atlanta area, four and a half million people. And I can tell you, they don't, they don't all get along. And we need to see that. But think about the culture we live in. Think about the movies that everybody wants to go see. I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you watch them, but I'm going to tell you, the things that seem to be real popular today are The Walking Dead. I, I just don't get into it. I can't understand somebody wanting to watch a movie where other people eat other people. I just, I don't get it. I just, I, I don't. And, and, and the movies, the videos that people watch, the game, if you watch the video game, it's all about killing people. What happened to something that's just fun? Pac-Man. I mean, Okay, so that's old school, but guess what? There's, uh, well, they are eating each other, but anyway. <laughs> you can't get away the video game. But what I'm saying is there's, there's, there's things that are wholesome you can do. What happened is going outside and having fun. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with putting a video game up and, you know, enjoying yourself. Uh, something that's innocent. You know what? I just, I don't understand why our culture has gotten to this point. Yes, I do. We're going to get to that. But God's commandment here. It says, thou shalt not murder. We live in a culture that forbids biblical, uh, biblical teaching. And, and man is made in God's image. But guess what? We can't talk about God in there. A school in Texas, I, I love this. You know what? I love people to revolt against the, the, the 
society we live in when it says you can't do something for God. They told this band, the court told this band that they could not play Christian music when they played music in the band. They were playing Amazing Grace. So you know what? I love this. You know what the group, the people did at the stadium? They broke out an Amazing Grace in acapella. Now what are they going to do? Stop them. You got four or five thousand people singing Amazing Grace in this, in this stadium. Tell them no. We, we cannot let people take our rights and freedoms away. And that's one of our freedoms is freedom to worship. Now, but there's people that want to take our freedom away. Listen to what uh, the founder of Planned Parenthood had to say. You think this isn't sick? Wait till you listen to this. The traditional view of the sanctity of human life will collapse under the pressure of scientific, theological, technological, and demographic development. You know, we kill more babies <coughs> in the United States than any war has ever dreamed of killing. Folks, I know there's a lot of things going on. But God is the creator of life. And God is the one who decides what we die, not us. We must protect human life. We must prohibit <coughs> murder of human beings. And it doesn't matter what kind of murder. Because we've got to be understanding what God's talking about. He's not talking about our forbidding us defending our own rights ourselves. Somebody comes in and breaks in your house and you happen to kill them because they're threatening you. God's not talking about that. God's not talking about a sovereign nation defending themselves in case of time of war. God's not talking about the taking of a life that has taken a life. The death penalty. He's not talking about any of those. He's not talking about those. He's not talking about police taking a life in the line of duty. Unfortunately, we've got police today that are crossing that line. But the reality is when they're doing that, they're not. And like I said, he's not forbidding capital punishment. Understand that in the Bible, there are 18 different things that you could do that call for capital punishment. So if God didn't believe in capital punishment, why on earth did he put it in there? So we need to understand there's cause and effect. The thief on the cross was found guilty of a crime committed that he committed and he was hung on the cross. And guess what? Although God said to him that day on the cross, Jesus looked at him and said, this day you'll be in paradise. Guess what? He died that day. He paid the price for the sins that he committed. But he was set free. The other thief, however, that's another story. That's another, another one altogether. It does not forbid the killing of animals. I know what people always are trying to tell me, but you've got to go back and study the scripture. They were taking animals and, and taking them and killing them and putting them on an altar. Now, please understand, there were very few times that they ever killed an animal and put it on an altar that they destroyed the whole animal. Most of it was roasted and eaten. Go back and read the scripture. Now, you know what? God understands. Y'all may not like this when I say that, but God understands there are certain things that we probably need to stay away from that are not healthy for us. And all the time, every time you would ever read it, all the fat and all the entrails, all the organs, all the inside, everything was always consumed completely and burned up. So if you ever ask me if I want liver, just read that scripture back again and understand. There's no way I'm putting liver in this matter. God said we need to burn it up, so I believe that's what we ought to do. Burn it up. goes right along with chitlins. I smelled them cooking one time, and I promise you they never going to grace this man. Not a chance. Now, pork chop, that's a different matter. But see, also you need to understand that one of the things that God did in this, now, there are eight different words that stand for the taking of another life. Now, the word that is used here, let me make sure I pronounce it, rasa, is used only one time for one connotation, and that is the taking of a life when you murder somebody, when you take an innocent life. It's never used in a, in, a, in a court of law. It's never used when you're talking about a, a death in military context. It's only taking of a human, innocent life. It's the only time this word is ever used. And God says that, so he makes sure that this one word was used so we understood that it is wrong to take a life unless they have taken a life because he didn't condemn it. capital punishment. It's also, it's not the word that they use when it calls for taking of an animal life. Animals do not have souls. I hate to disappoint you. And all dogs don't go to heaven. Because I've had one. There ain't no way they're going to heaven. And I know some of yours are no way they're going to heaven. I'm sorry, Peter. Pocket ain't the worst one. I hate she got a little sneaky one likes to 
and then get a heartbeat behind. But it does talk about the killing of a human innocent life. And folks, I'm going to tell you, we've got to be aware that we're not doing a very good job of protecting the sanctity of life. If you think that euthanasia is right, then I want to go back and remind you of what happened when Terry Schiavo was starved to death. Y'all remember her? Those are old enough to remember. Here's what happened. Her husband, she had had an accident. She was in a coma and had been in a coma for, I believe, seven years. She had never done anything. They were, she was on a feeding tube. She was breathing on her own. Now, this is very important. She was breathing on her own, but she was on a feeding tube in a coma. And her husband petitioned the court because he had already had two children by the girl that he was living with that he wasn't married to. And he had to get her out of the way so he could marry the mother of his two kids. So he finally petitioned the court. The court agreed to take the food away from her, starve her to death, and she died. That's murder. About a year later, maybe not quite that long, there was a gentleman in almost the identical situation. He had been in a coma. He was on a feeding tube, breathing on his own, and everybody thought because there was no discernible brain activity, he was dead, and he woke up. He woke up. He was not brain dead. Although they could not discern any brain activity in his brain at all. They tried to tell people that he was dead. He was not dead. She was not dead. We are not the ones to choose whether people live or die. Only God. I know people go through an immense amount of pain. I want to tell you, I sat there when Mr. Raymond said, just give me the gun and let me shoot myself. And he knows it was wrong. He was in that much pain. I can't do that. That's not right. Miss Jackie and I knew that when he said it. We knew what he was going through. God delivered him. That's all I can say. He does forbid the intentional murder and malicious murder and of any life, human life. It doesn't matter. And so that includes homicide, the taking of a life in the commission of a crime or just the taking of a life. Uh, did you know that most crimes like that are committed by somebody that knows the person they killed? So you all just understand that. And then suicide is wrong. That's the taking of your own life. Suicide, the definition of suicide is self-murder. And then euthanasia, which is taking the, the old people and putting them out of their misery because they don't have any, they don't offer any viable service to the world anymore, so they don't need to live. So you need to be wary of that because guess what? If our society gets to that point, when you get to a certain age, they're going to euthanize you because you don't serve any value. You're costing society money. <coughs> We need to be careful about what we have in place. And of course, last but not least, uh, abortion and infant suffering, which is the taking of a human life. And if you ever think that, that's, that there's not a human life, they took the life of a young lady, and I got to see her stand on stage when she, after she was aborted singing Christian songs. And if you want to know, go on YouTube and find the name of Rebecca St. James and look up her testimony. She was aborted. So if you can't tell, you tell me that they're not alive before they're born, you're lying. God says they're alive from the day of conception. But we justify it. Listen to what uh, another sicko said. Said back to the human beings, the sense of a member of the species Homo sapien is not relevant to the wrongness of killing. It is rather the characteristics like rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness that makes a difference. Infants lack these characteristics. Killing them, therefore, cannot be equated with killing normal human beings or any other self-conscious being. That's a bunch of hogwash. I don't care what you want to call it. But you know what? That's not the bad murders. That's not the ones that I really want to cover today. I want to talk to you about the invisible murders. Y'all familiar with them? Y'all know what an invisible murder is? We're going to find out. I'm going to go over here to Matthew. And I want to read this with you so you'll understand what an invisible murder is. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said in the old days, You shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be in danger of judgment. I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever says to his brother, Rocco, which is in danger of the council, but whosoever says you fool shall be in danger of fire. It's the most devious of all murders. It's the deception of yourself. It occurs on a daily basis by Christians and non-Christians 
alike. We murder people's personalities and their reputations. Some may have even committed it to this point. When you're angry with somebody, we go just the Bible reads and guess what? God calls it murder. It's calling the taking of a life. And we need to understand that. Jesus taught that, that it's wrong, that it's equal to murder. So when you are angry with somebody with no justifiable reason, then you've committed murder. You're doing wrong. We're doing wrong. Uh, and so we need to, if we harbor hatred for somebody and bitterness, and we're committing that invisible murder. Angry without cause. Remember, Jay, Jesus got angry. He was justified. Because he said he went into the temple and he started turning over the tables because they were they were stealing and robbing and, and looting the people as they came into the temple to worship. Folks, when we don't honor God, when we walk in here, we're robbing God. We're stealing from God. That means we're murdering. We're taking it. We harbor resentment. You know what? I, I, I love this because you know what? The greatest group of people to harbor resentment are preachers. You don't know that? We're the worst. You know why? Well, here's why it happens. Willie, he had this book. He got, he, man, he got the big church. He got the big church. He don't have to do nothing to study him. He don't go visit. He don't do nothing. Isn't that awesome? Man, I hate him. <laughs> we, get jealous. we get jealous. Jealousy is a form of hatred, which is a form of murder. I murdered his reputation because I'm jealous of who he is and what he's got going for him. we got to be careful of that. You know what? If somebody does good, if the church does good, don't get upset because they're doing good. Praise God. We need to be excited for them. We don't need to harbor resentment. We don't need to slander. Now, I, I say this a lot of times, and you might hear this again in a couple of weeks when we get to thou shalt not uh, lie. But listen to this. When is the truth a lie? Think about it. You say, well, the truth can't be a lie. Yes, it can. And here's why the truth can be a lie. When you tell somebody something and you're doing it to put them down, to slander them, to make them less than what you are, that is a lie. You're slandering them because you're doing it to gain personal game. And you're wrong. If you've got to slander somebody, if you've got to bring out all the dirt about somebody to make yourself look better, then I'm sorry, you're in trouble already. Because if you can't stand on your own merits, you don't think about it. Think about how people operate today. Think about our politicians. I want one year, one year, I would love to see a politician who tells me what they can do and not what's wrong with the other guy. Amen. Tell me what's going to benefit me. How are you going to help me? Not how this guy's not going to help me and make it worse. I want to know what's good, not bad. I want to hear the positives in it. And we, they slander one another. Folks, when we don't honor God and we say something about somebody that they got something and they didn't get something, do something, they don't do something, we're slandering them. We're committing crime. God says we're, we're guilty. The question is, are you guilty? But that's not the worst yet. Here's the worst part. 2,000 years ago, a group of men got together, priests and church people, and they decided they didn't like what Jesus was teaching. So here's what they did. They, they took him to court. Well, that court couldn't do anything. They didn't have any power to crucify him or to put him out and get rid of him. So they took him to the Roman court. The Roman court couldn't find anything wrong with him. So they made the Roman court feel guilty about the position they were in. Sound familiar? And, and said that you're, not, you're no friend of Rome if you let this man live. Because he says he's the king. And, and so he says, I find no fault in him. You take him out and crucify him. And here's what's happened. They took him out and crucified him. And you and I nailed him to the cross. We murdered an innocent man. You say, I didn't do it. If you're saved, if you are saved, if you're not saved, you put the nails in Jesus' hand because the only thing that held him to the cross was our sin. Amen. It wasn't those nails. We nailed him to the cross. He hung on that cross for you and I. We committed the most heinous crime of all. We took the Son of God, the one and only Son of God, the beloved Son of God, who came down from heaven to set aside His royalty and die on the cross for me. I put the nails in His hands. And you did too. So we're guilty of the most heinous crime of all because we killed, you can do all these other things, but we killed the Son of God. There's nothing any worse. But you know what? Just like you just saw in that drama, guess what He did? He threw those chains off and said, He says, come to me. Come to me. And I'll give you rest. 
He said the chains will be gone. Folks, life is full of preserving. What does your life look like today? Are you living a life that's alive? Are you crucifying God all over again? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're standing there and those chains have got you wrapped up in your life and you're just you're consumed with, with the world that you're living in and it's got control of you and it's tugging you, you notice how they tug back and forth. It's tugging you over and over again, this way, this way, this way. I'm going to tell you what sin does for you. I've said it before, you need to listen to this. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it's going to cost you more than you want to pay. And I promise you, it will happen every time. I don't care what it is. It's going to do that to you every single time. But you have an out. If you don't have Jesus Christ today, you can come down and say, you know what, I need Jesus. Sure. I need Him in my heart. Amen. I need Him in my life. I, I need to be something I'm not. I was sharing, and I can tell you right now, Brandis and I were talking yesterday. We had some good conversation. And she said, well, I don't know how to tell, tell my testimony. I said, Brandis, this is what you do. Well, this is what any of you do. You know what? I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. And here's, here's a simple way to tell people. I'm a beggar telling another beggar how to find the bread of life. That's all I am. We need to see that and understand that. So if you don't know that bread of life, today's the day you come and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Come say, you know what? I need that peace. It doesn't mean all your problems are going to wait, but it's going to be somebody who's going to walk with you through everything you deal with in your life. Right. And then maybe you're a Christian. And guess what? The world's tugging away at you and you're, you're letting all these things take you away to where you don't need to be. Maybe today's the day when you say, you know what, I'm tired of living this lie of not serving God the way He called me to serve and doing what He asked me to do. And today I'm going to surrender to Him and I'm going to give up who I am so I can serve Him to the best of my ability. And you give it up and you come and say, you know what, I, just, I, need, to, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. I need to give it all over again to Him because I've not served Him like I should. And you do that today. And since we've got a lot of people here that are not members of our church, I pick them because I know most of I know everybody here, but uh, except for one, she's visiting with us first time. I'm, I'm glad she's here with us. But I'm going to tell you, everybody else I recognize. But you know what? Maybe you haven't ever joined a church. Or maybe you're, you're looking for where God wants you to serve. Maybe this is the place. I don't know. Only you and God can make that decision. I'm not going to tell you where God wants you to serve because God will reveal that to you. Because you'll have a peace that just passes all understanding. It's like when I came to this church as the pastor. I want to tell you, it was, a, it was an awesome time. You know how I knew that I knew that I knew that I was in the right place? I've told this before, but i got to tell it again so I can get you ready. So you'll know when, when the right place for you to serve. March the 19th, 19, uh, 2006, I preached my trial sermon. But I knew, actually, before then, that this was where God wanted me to serve. And here's the two things that happened. One... When the search committee was sharing with me, and I was, they, we came over here and we met in the pastor's office, and we were walking around the church grounds, and they asked me, they said, do you want to see the sanctuary? Well, I'm one of these people, I want to see every church. If I go by a church, I'd like to stop and look on the inside if I could, if it was unlocked. But, you know, some of them frown when you're going in when they're not open, so whatever. Uh, but I, if it's unlocked, I'll go, I'll walk through it, and I walk through the church. And here's, here's how I knew I, I was where I needed to be, where God was serving me. First, I walked in this building, and there was an awesome spirit in this building. Nobody was here. But I knew God came here with the people that were worshiping here. The other thing that I knew that day was that thing right there. Y'all may not understand that. My wife plays the piano. And I walked in here and there's a young chain. That's what that is. Y'all may not know that. It's the only imported piano that has a wood sounding board. It gives a very full, very rich sound to be a small piano. The church that we met at and that we... She played the piano for many years and has a young chain. Same type of piano, different color. And I just knew that would just that would make her feel good. And I know it has. The other thing is that first Sunday that I was here, I just had an unbelievable feeling of awesomeness of who God was. But even before that day, there's one last thing that I can say that really made the difference. I was standing here and uh, I came over here. Y'all were getting ready to do here you'll have to get ready to do Champion of Love. I don't know if y'all remember that one. We've done this once since I've been here. But we're getting ready, they're getting ready. The choir was up here getting ready to practice Champion of Love. I walk in when they're practicing because Nancy and I would brought some stuff to the house. 
And I walked over here, and you know what? This may sound strange, but I knew I was in the right place. Y'all won't never believe how I knew I was in the right place. I looked at the choir standing there, and not one of the ladies had their shoes on. <laughs> I said, I'm on board. That's a weird thing. Why is that so different? Because people said they can relax and work. Folks, wherever God serves, put you to serve. You need to serve. You need to work. God doesn't expect people to be spectators. He expects them to be workers. And we need workers every day. We can always use more. And if God has placed you here, then come and serve with us. But whatever God has laid on your heart, you let God lead you today. Let's go to word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you again for this day. What an awesome privilege it is once again to be in your presence. And Lord, may we understand it today. And that Lord, when we fail to honor you, when we have grudges and other problems with people, then Lord, we're no better than the person who commits a heinous crime of murder. Because Lord, we've murdered them with our heart and with our soul and with our spirit. And Lord, we need to repent of those things when we have harboring bitterness toward people. And release that bitterness and let them know that we love them. And just, Lord, go on with who we are and honor you with who we are and what we're doing. Go forward with where we need to be. But Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that today that Holy Spirit will convict them like they've never had before. Then, Lord, they too can know what it means to have those chains fall on. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes.